welcome to Health Matters. My name's Justine Ginsberg and I'm your host. Now the weather is warmer and we want to shake off the glumness of winter and get outside into that glorious sunshine. But there really are some things we need to think about. The most common cancer in the United States is skin cancer, with over 5 million cases each year, and fortunately, it is one of the most curable cancers. Almost 90% of non-melanoma cancers and 85% of melanoma skin cancers are associated with exposure to ultraviolet light, specifically the sun, so sun protection is so important to protect you and your family. Today we are joined on Health Matters by Catherine Taylor, who's an APRN from East Granby Family Practice. And she's gonna talk with us about sun safety, skin cancer, and summer safety. Welcome, Kate. Thank you very much. And yes, please call me Kate. <laughs> so <laughs> we, can, we can relax a little bit because our, our folks at home on Health Matters love to feel like they're, they're in the living room with us. So we know skin cancer is one of the most common cancers. Mm -hmm. We also know that it is one of the most preventable. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about skin cancer and the different forms that there are? Sure. One of the most common forms of skin cancer is basal cell. And it's one of the slowest growing and it often will be in sun exposed areas, so such as the face or neck. Um, it can appear flat and pink, but often it's a pearly bump. Uh -huh. And you'll start noticing when you look at it that there's some blood vessels in them. Mm -hmm. Now, if it gets treated, that's wonderful, and it needs to be removed completely or it can come back. Uh -huh. If it's ignored, it actually can go deeper into the tissues, possibly okay. even into the bones. So it's very important that it does get removed. Okay. Um, the next form is squamous cell. Okay. And squamous cell often is pink, red, can be rough looking, mm -hmm. can be a sore, a sore that doesn't heal. And sometimes they're the flaky ones. They almost yep. seem like on the nose and around the face. Yep, and they can start with something called actinic keratosis or sol um, solar keratosis. Okay. And those can turn into um, squamous cell cancer. Okay. So, um, Oftentimes the actinic keratosis is treated so it doesn't turn into something else. Okay. I often will think or say as a rule of thumb, if you have a sore that does not heal within two weeks, it should be evaluated. Um, if you're picking at it, it's not going to heal. <laughs> so don't pick at it. <laughs> and you know, you think about some of those basal cells that start on your face, like on the end of your nose, mm -hmm. and it's that irritating, flaky, you know, what is that? You think it's dead skin and you just keep pulling at it. Yep, and that often can be, that could be squamous. So that too should be removed. Okay. Then we have melanoma. Okay. And melanoma is the um, most invasive of those three. And there's something called the ABCDE of melanoma. Okay. And it's A is asymmetry, so there is no shape. You can't really describe it as circular, annular, you can't do that. And then B is borders. The borders are blurred. Mm -hmm. You can't see, typically borders are very well marked on a freckle and you can't see that mm -hmm. with this. C is color, variation of color. D is diameter, so over six millimeters, mm -hmm. which is the end of a pencil. Mm -hmm. And E is evolving. Yeah. So if somebody has a, something that they're concerned about and maybe not melanoma, but there's, they're thinking it's changing, what I recommend is that you take a ruler, put it against that spot and take a picture and keep an eye on it. Absolutely. And it also helps if you see a dermatologist, then you can show them what it's doing and evolving. And you know, that body mapping, you know, that, that skin mapping. I know in Australia where I was born, you know, skin cancer is such a huge issue in mm -hmm. Australia. And there's a big trend to actually do skin mapping at least once a year and to really do a top to tail. Because yep, makes as sense. you and I were talking in the break, you know, some of these things can appear in not so obvious places. Yes. You know, what are some of the more uncommon places? I know I had a, um, a, a colleague that I worked with that actually had a melanoma that appeared behind her knee. Mm -hmm. That's very true, that can happen. And this is not common, but it can even happen in the vagina, melanoma. Wow. So um, definitely get your female exams done too. Now, I do recommend if you have a family history of melanoma, mm -hmm. you should be seeing a dermatologist. Yeah. And if you have a personal history of cancer, you should be continuing to see a dermatologist. And people at risk for skin cancer are the fair skin, family history, as I said, of melanoma. That, that puts you and I right in the firing exactly. line. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And having, and once again, I'm in the firing line, um, having had severe sunburns as a kid. Yeah, and you know, we're gonna talk a little bit later on about prevention, because as you all know, public health and a lot of what we do in relation to healthcare is about how do we prevent it? You know, uh, what do they say? Um, uh, an ounce of, of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Yes. 
Um, but you know, talking about um, going back to the A B C D E, you know, one of the other things that I think is always interesting is the colour. It's not always black and noxious. No. Nope. They can even be red and blue mm -hmm. and you know, interesting colours that you wouldn't necessarily think is a mole or a spot. Mm. So if you do see a spot that you are concerned about, have it evaluated. Absolutely. And you know, when you have your annual physical, really making sure that you point out to your primary care provider any of those little spots, because you know, as much as a, a, an annual physical is top to tail, mm -hmm. you do need to point out, you know, I've had this little spot that I'm concerned exactly. about. Exactly. So, you know, keep an eye on it. And, you know, if you've got a partner in your life, check the parts of you that you can't see. Yep. So, you know, a bit like tick checks, make sure someone's checking your back and behind your legs so you've got those, those areas covered. All right. So, um, I know in Australia we talk about, um, we have a slogan called slip, slop, slap. Slip on a shirt, slop on sunscreen, mm -hmm. and slap on a hat. How do we prevent this? So we'll start with the clothing first. Okay. <laughs> Any clothing gives you some sun protection, okay. but the more tightly woven clothing gives you even more, and there's even clothing out there that has the UVP, or U, um, like ultraviolet sun protection. Yep. Um, and those are wonderful because you with sunscreen, you really should be applying it every two hours for, to be effective. Mm -hmm. And this way, you have this long sleeve rash guard on, especially if you're in doing water sports, where you're gonna be constantly wet, and even if the sunscreen is waterproof, still some is gonna <laughs> um, wash off. So those, I think something like that, hats, are important three inch brim, and you're saying a lot of times um, some of the hats will have the protection for the neck too. And um, you need protection for the ears because that's a common spot for skin yep. cancer is the ears. And I mean, if you think about it, it's not just going to the beach, it's not just sunbathing. I mean, you think about the amount of yard work we do in the summertime, and often we're out there with our mm -hmm. hat on our heads, and you think of the top of our ears, even if we're wearing a baseball cap, the top it. of our ears are not protected. So, right. you know, and that's a, an area where you're sweating, you're not reapplying sunscreen every exactly. two hours. Exactly, exactly. Let's also talk about our little people and mm -hmm. um, our elderly population. I mean, we've got little bubbers that have got brand new skin that is going out into this, this um, bright sun sunlight and our elderly population with very frail and paper thin skin even more we need to be pr pr protective of them right and it may be avoiding the um strong sun hours which are 10 a.m to 4 p.m absolutely you know again you think about entertaining in the summer you know if you're going to set up your picnic table try to choose a place that's out of the direct sunlight exactly. make sure that everybody's got sunscreen on like you said about the rashes and the all over protection you know if you've got kids jumping in and out of the swimming pool all day on top of having to monitor them, you're not putting sunscreen on every two right, hours. You're not. You're not. <laughs> so really think about that as well. And sunglasses. Oh, of course. Yeah. Because we get damage to our eyes as well, don't we? Mm hmm So I whitewater kayak, and I um, went to the eye doctor, and they mentioned how I, I don't want to say my age, but I'm in my 40s, have um, start early cataracts. And it's from the reflection of the water. Wow, so there you go, yep. sunglasses. So really, you need a proper kit, just like in the, in the wintertime when we're out skiing. We really need to make sure that mm -hmm. we've got eye protection and protection on our, our heads as well. So let's talk about sunscreen, yep. because the viewers at home are going to say, but there's so many I can buy, what's the right one? SPF 30 plus. Mm -hmm. Yes. Broad spectrum. Broad spectrum, yes. And water resistant. Mm -hmm. And water resistant, exactly. And it's not just because you're swimming, we also sweat a lot in the summer. <laughs> Right. So make sure that you've got um, the, the appropriate sunscreen on the, and that you are applying it to the manufacturer's um, instructions as well. Because some of them are, you know, you can't apply them on your face and some of them are, you know, have a, a slightly different um, application method. And there is some controversy. I know in Hawaii, some of the um, sunscreen um, ingredients are banned. There's also zinc oxide, which is a more of a physical barrier. Uh -huh. So you are going to have see it on you, but that that there's no concern about the chemicals there. You know, in Australia, all of our cricketers wear zinc on their nose. In mm -hmm. fact, you don't play cricket unless you have a big stripe of zinc yep. and they actually make it in different colors. So you can so, be breast cancer fine. aware. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so also there are people who are at higher risk and you know the folks at home know that I suffer from lupus and not only does the condition create sun sensitivity, mm -hmm. but some of the medications that we're oh, yes. on. So can you tell us, or the viewers, about some of the medications that increase your risk of sun exposure? So one medication that gets prescribed quite often in this time of year is um, to treat Lyme because mm -hmm. of where we live. So doxycycline can make you very photosensitive. 
So if you are on that medication, you pretty it's not just sunscreen, it's <laughs> avoiding the sun. Um, and then, so that there are the um, tetracyclines can do that, but especially doxycycline. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even ibuprofen in a leaf can give you some sensitivity to the really? sun. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that can do that. Um, some other medications that will be used, uh, there's another antibiotic, sorry, called uh, ciprofloxacin. Mm -hmm. That also can do it. Um, amitriptyline, which mm -hmm. may be used for fibromyalgia, mm -hmm. also um, for other things too, but that, that can cause it. Mm -hmm. And there's a blood pressure, there's a blood, I'm um, sorry, heart medication called amiodarone uh -huh. that can do it. So, you know, really think about talking to your provider and also reading the instructions on your medications. Mm. I mean, our pharmacists are our best friends. They're part of our right. healthcare team. If you are someone who spends a lot of time outdoors, really check to make sure your medications don't increase your risk. And as Kate said, some medications mean you really just need to stay out of the sun. Yep, I thought of one more. Yes. Because people are on this one, hydrochlorothiazide which is for blood pressure. Mm -hmm. That's another one that Absolutely. can do it. And you know, some conditions are actually triggered by the sun. I know with lupus, I end up in flares if I'm out okay. in the, um, the bright sunlight for too long. So be aware of the, the different conditions that you might have and the sensitivities that you might have and how that might impact your condition in the long term. Yep. All right, what else can we talk about with the sun? Um, how about we switch gears? Sure. How about we talk about um, hyperthermia so not hypothermia we talked about that over winter time now we're talking hyperthermia mm -hmm. what is it so hypothermia is when the body temperature is more elevated than normal and that can happen because the body is either absorbing or producing more heat than it can dissipate through sweating uh -huh. so the temperature starts going up mm -hmm. and this can be dangerous there's different levels of hyperthermia a less severe form is more of a heat exhaustion. Okay. And you can start having um, headaches. Mm -hmm. There will be, um, you might have some nausea, mm -hmm. could even be some vomiting. And mm -hmm. if you have vomiting and you cannot drink fluids, that can be a medical emergency. Um, and fatigue um, or weakness mm -hmm. is another one for mm -hmm. that one. Um, and profuse sweating. Mm -hmm. So then the treatment for that is to get into a cool area. If you can get into an air conditioned room, all the better, but if not, at least the shade and drink fluids, including electrolyte replacements. Yep. So, um, cause with sweating, you are losing a lot of potassium. Absolutely, and that of course... Oh, sorry, sodium <laughs> and potassium. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about some of the underlying conditions that people have, cardiac conditions, etc., yes. you know, that yes. can cause arrhythmias. Exactly. You know, we've really got to be careful about our, again, our underlying health uh, conditions. Okay, so we've got um, heat exhaustion. Now we haven't, we haven't picked up those warning signs we've just mm -hmm. pushed on through. Now we're going to be suffering from heat stroke. Exactly. What does that look like? Heat stroke, you can have the same symptoms as with um, the heat exhaustion, but now you're also getting a, hap a rapid heart rate, mm -hmm. confusion. Mm -hmm. You may even stop sweating. Mm -hmm. um, lethargy, and um, to the point in mental status changes. This is a medical emergency. You can end up having a coma and dying if it's not treated. So if you start noticing that maybe somebody that you're with is not acting correctly, you have to start thinking about, and it's a hot day, you have to start thinking about what's going on. And you know, I always wonder and worry about people at the beach who go down for the day and they, they set themselves up and then they fall asleep. Mm -hmm. And they're asleep in that bright exposed mm. sun, sometimes for long periods, because let's face it, how many of us get a day off where we can just sleep? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that beautiful warm sun puts you into that coma like state of, I just want to, I just want to keep snoozing all day. You can, you can progress from being you know, having heat exhaustion to heat stroke pretty quickly. Mm. And out there on the beach, if you don't have anybody with you, can be pretty um, dangerous. Our little people and our, our older population are much more at risk, aren't they? Exactly, yep. Um, and so making sure people are drinking fluids throughout the day. Yep. And water, water, water. But yes, <laughs> if you are, if it's a very hot day and you're, especially being physically active, whether it's your job or you are choosing to be physically active, um, electrolyte replacement. I would recommend. I don't always recommend electrolyte replacements, but on days like that, I do. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, 
I know when I was um, nursing in Australia and I was working in intensive care, summertime was always a time we dreaded because we had a sharp increase in the amount of spinal injuries that would mm -hmm. come into our unit. And unfortunately, a lot of the spinal injuries were due to swimming-related or water-related accidents. Of course. Can we talk a little bit about summer safety in the water? Yep. So I think something important is knowing what the hazards are <laughs> in the water. So know that if you are going to dive, you are in water that's deep enough for you. Don't go blindly into the water. Um, the, uh, let's see, it's the Water Safety USA mm -hmm. has a great website and they talk about three elements of water competency. And there's water smarts. Mm -hmm. So it's knowing your skills and knowing the hazards of the water. Mm -hmm. Then there's um, water, let's see, Water smarts. There's one. The next one is water. I believe it is water skills. Mm -hmm. But it's then having. Um, oh my gosh, I forgot what it is. So the, I think <laughs> the water skills. That's all right. I think that it's the ability to actually swim. Oh yeah, yeah. It is. Sorry. It's the ability <laughs> to know how to tread water. Yes. Know how to resurface if you're over your head. Know how to float and know how to swim 25 yards. Because that is very important, because if you're in a situation you don't want to panic, um, then there is helping others, and with the helping others is to be observant, watch, watch whoever you're supposed to be with, and also um, no CPR. Absolutely. And you know, it's one of the things, particularly with all the beautiful natural water bodies we have here in Connecticut, mm -hmm. um, there are these amazing big lakes and ponds often that are swimmable. Yep. So people will go out and remembering you might have enough, um, enough endurance to get out once you're in the middle of the mm -hmm. lake and you turn around and you just realize how far you've swum, you've got to get back. Exactly. And don't go swimming alone. No. Never go swimming alone in a water body because um, you've got nobody there to spot you and to recognize if there's a problem. Don't be overly confident. If you're not a strong and confident swimmer, whatever you do, don't go out further than you can make back. It's a bit like going out for a run. Right. Make sure you can return. Equally, if you're swimming at the beach, remember the riptides that happen at the ocean. I mean, water can seem very um, calm, but it's the undercurrent that can actually pull you out. Um, with kids and the float um, devices, if you're in the ocean, recognize they can suddenly take you out a very long way very quickly. Mm -hmm. And if mum and dad lose, um, lose sight of the little ones playing in the water, they can just disappear in amongst the crowd. Exactly. So recognizing that. Um, I know the other thing um, in Australia that we always worry about, because most homes have swimming pools, is drowning in infants. Yes. And children can drown in just a very small amount of water. Um, so if you do have swimming pools, making sure that they are appropriately fenced, that you have um, rescue apparatus that is available, um, make sure that everybody who is an adult knows how to do CPR. Right. Um, make sure you have a phone that you're able to access in, in an emergency and that no children ever swim without supervision. Mm -hmm. um, I know another problem we have in water accidents, at least in Australia, is alcohol. Very true. Um, you know, one of the things that happens, I think, when we drink too much alcohol, we get a little bit... Um, cocky. A little cocky. <laughs> <laughs> That's the word I was looking for. Mm -hmm. we, um, we think we can do a lot more than we actually can, and we're more likely to do um, things that aren't so smart. Um, equally, boating accidents. Yes. So we... Um, if you're going to be swimming where there are... And this may not be where you're going, but where there are boats... Mm -hmm definitely have somebody with you, as in a, a kayak with you or a rowboat or an, something because they can't spot you. A motorboat may not be able to spot you. Absolutely. I know there's sometimes people will do a float and then a flag to show that where they are. Mm -hmm. And um, something I want to talk about sure. is uh, life vests. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Need to wear life vests. Kayaking, and stand-up paddle boarding. Mm -hmm. They should be used. And as I mentioned earlier, I do whitewater kayaking. That is part of our uniform. Yeah. That's our gear. And without it, we wouldn't be out on the water. Same with because of what we do in the river, we also wear helmets. I'm not recommending in, in flat water that you're doing helmets, but we even do that. And, and even tubing. I mean, you look at the, the big tubes mm -hmm. that they have running down the Farmington River. Right. I mean, you can get into some rapids yep. quickly, and you can get into trouble. 
if that upends yep. and you don't have a life vest on. Exactly. And and also sometimes people will try and stand in the water and if ever you're standing in water that's above your knees, mm -hmm. you should not be facing downward because it can knock you over and you can't think about it, your face is now down. So Absolutely. Um, so I have a deep respect for moving water. I have a deep respect for any water, but definitely moving water. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, recognizing that it's vitally important that we do keep an eye on each other and that you have that, that buddy system mm -hmm. if you're going to be, you know, swimming and you have young children swimming. All right, shifting gears, allergies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to spring and summer. Yes. Mm -hmm. How do we spot the difference between an allergy and a cold? How do we uh, treat ourselves with allergies? And then, of course, the dreaded poison ivy. <laughs> so sometimes it's, sometimes it's not always clear between the allergies and the cold, but oftentimes with allergies, you can tell from what's happening outside. But it's um, itchy, burning eyes, mm -hmm. sneezing. So um, post-nasal drip you can have with both, but there <laughs> tends to be a lot of post-nasal drip going on too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what's the best thing that we can take for allergies? Often people have them for persistent periods of time. Yes, so there's different things you can take. And one thing I, I always recommend is um, some people are not a fan of the neti pot uh -huh. or the saline spray, so at least, or a saline rinse, I'm sorry, so at least the saline spray, especially if you've just been outside uh -huh. and you've been working outside, you've been around a lot of allergens, rinse those allergens out of your sinuses. Taking a shower can help too, but okay. definitely um, getting it out. out. <laughs> <laughs> so those can help, and they are recommended highly by ear, nose, throat um, specialists too, and allergists. Um, there's the steroid nasal sprays, yep. which are now over the counter. Oh wow, that's fabulous. Yep. So you can get, I think all of them actually are over the counter. If you do end up having um, nosebleeds, stop, because it can cause some sensitivity sure. to the um, blood vessels. There's the over-the-counter Claritin, Allegra, um, Zyrtec okay. um, that you can take too for it. And there's things that you can just, to try and avoid the allergies <laughs> is a big part of it. <laughs> All right, so in, in avoiding allergies as a, as a new New Englander, <laughs> are you kidding me? Right, what, you can't. What is with <laughs> this poison ivy stuff? Oh yeah, sorry. Man, is that, is that like... That's nasty stuff. Sorry to say this, but I don't get it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, man. you can still get it no matter it's what. Called being, it's called being an immigrant. <laughs> so, all right. So, what? How do we stop the spread of this? We've only got two minutes, of okay. course. Okay. So, if you're near water, which you probably are not going to be when you get affected by it, but if you can wash it off with hot soapy water within ten minutes, that's great. Um, know that often it can be on other inanimate objects. <laughs> so, if you are out gardening and you're wearing gloves. Those gloves can carry the oil, so you need to wash those. Gotcha. So that would be, gr if you can do it that way, you're good. But other things that you can do once you have it, calamine lotion mm -hmm. can help. And I know I'm saying this as somebody who doesn't have it, so I'm sorry. <laughs> and then <laughs> um, calamine lotion, cool compresses. Okay. Not hot, cool compresses can help decrease that itch. Even the oatmeal baths. Uh -huh. And um, histamines do not help with it. So, but Benadryl can make you sleepy. So if you're scratching at night, we recommend taking Benadryl at night, not because it's gonna help with the rash, but it's gonna help you sleep. Excellent. Wow, so as always, there is far too much to talk about than we have time. So Kate, do you think you'll come back and join us again? Maybe next time we'll talk about women's health? That would be great, thank you. Excellent, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. So, Today we talked about the importance of sun protection and the prevention of skin cancers. We also talked about how to monitor your body for changes to moles and spots. Remember the ABCDEs of early detection of skin cancer. Asymmetry, border, colour, diameter and evolving. Please ensure that you contact your doctor about any changes or concerns about spots that you have on your skin. We also talked about summer safety, being safe in pools and river systems, ensuring you and your family remain hydrated and do not develop hyperthermia, as well as how to manage many of the allergies that we often suffer from at this time of year. It's important to remember to actively enjoy these warmer summer months. It's an ounce of prevention is worth so much more than a pound of cure. For more information and fact sheets about today's topics, please go to our website, www.fvhd.org or of course our Facebook site. Until next time, remember your greatest wealth 
is your health.